The Virgin of the Cosmos Part 1 The Beautiful Teachings of Isis Having thus spoken, Isis first pours out for Horus the sweet draught of immortality which souls receive from the gods, and thus begins the most holy discourse. Heaven, crowned with stars, is placed above universal nature, O my son Horus, and nothing is wanting to it of that which constitutes the whole world. It is necessary, then, that all nature should be adorned and completed by that which is above her, for this order could not proceed from below to above. The supremacy of the greater mysteries over the lesser is imperative. Celestial order reigns over terrestrial order, as being absolutely determined, and inaccessible to the idea of death. Wherefore, the things below lament, being filled with fear before the marvelous beauty and eternal permanence of the heavenly world. For, indeed, a spectacle worthy of contemplation and desire were these magnificences of heaven, revelations of the divine as yet unknown, and this sumptuous majesty of night illumined with a penetrating radiance, albeit less than that of the sun, and all these other mysteries which move above in harmonious cadence, ruling and maintaining the things below by secret influences. And so long as the universal architect refrained from putting an end to this incessant fear, to these anxious investigations, ignorance enveloped the universe. But when he judged good to reveal himself to the world, he breathed into the gods the enthusiasm of love, and poured into their mind the splendor which his bosom contained that they might first be inspired with the will to seek, next with the desire to find, and lastly with the power to readjust. Now, my wondrous child Horus, all this could not happen among mortals, for as yet they did not exist, but it took place in the universal soul in sympathy with the mysteries of heaven. This was Hermes, the cosmic thought. He beheld the universe of things, and having seen, he understood, and having understood, he had the power to manifest and to reveal. That which he thought, he wrote, that which he wrote, he in great part concealed, wisely silent. And speaking by turns, so that while the world should last, these things might be sought. And thus, having enjoined upon the gods, his brethren, that they should follow in his train, he ascended to the stars. But he had for successor his son, and the heir of his knowledges, Tat, and a little later, Asclepius, son of Amouth, by the counsels of Pan and Hephaestus, and all those for whom sovereign providence reserved an exact knowledge of heavenly things. Hermes then justified himself in the presence of those who surrounded him, in that he had not delivered the integral theory to his son, on account of his youth. But I having arisen, beheld with my eyes, which see the invisible secrets of the beginnings of things, and at length, but with certainty, I understood that the sacred symbols of the cosmic elements were hidden near the secrets of Osiris. Hermes returned to heaven, having pronounced an invocatory speech. It is not fitting, O oh my son, that this recital be left incomplete, you must be informed of the words of Hermes when he laid down his books. O oh, sacred books, he said, of the immortals, you in whose pages my hand has recorded the remedies by which incorruptibility is conferred, remain forever beyond the reach of destruction and of decay, 
invisible and concealed from all who frequent these regions, until the day shall come in which the ancient heaven shall bring forth instruments worthy of you, whom the Creator shall call souls. Having pronounced upon his books this invocation, he wrapped them in their coverings, returned into the sphere which belonged to him, and all remained hidden for a sufficient space. And nature, O oh my son, was barren until the hour in which those who are ordained to survey the heavens, advancing towards the divine, the king of all things, deplored the general inertia, and affirmed the necessity of setting forth the universe. No other than himself could accomplish this work. They said, We pray that you, consider that which already is, and that which is necessary for the future. At these words, the Divine smiled benignant, and commanded nature to exist. And, issuing with his voice, the feminine came forth in her perfect beauty. The gods with amaze beheld this marvel. And the great ancestor, pouring out for nature an elixir, commanded her to be fruitful, and forthwith, penetrating the universe with his glance, he cried, Let heaven be the plenitude of all things, and of the air, and of the ether the divine spake, and it was done. But nature, communing with herself, understood that she might not transgress the commandment of the Father, and, uniting herself to labor, she produced a most beautiful daughter, whom she called Invention, and to whom the Divine accorded being. And having differentiated created forms, he filled them with mysteries, and gave the command of them to Invention. Then, not willing that the upper world should be inactive, he saw fit to fill it with spirits, in order that no region should remain in immobility and inertia, and in the accomplishment of his work he used his sacred art. For, taking of himself such essence as was necessary, and mingling with it an intellectual flame, he combined with these other materials by unknown ways. And having achieved by secret formulas the union of these principles, he endowed with motion the universal combination. Gradually, in the midst of the protoplasm, glittered a substance more subtle, purer, more limpid, than the elements from which it was generated. It was transparent, and the artist alone perceived it. Soon, it attained its perfection, being neither melted by the fire, nor chilled by the breath, but possessing the stability of a special combination, and having its proper type and constitution. He bestowed on it a happy name, and, according to the similitude of its energies, he called it self-consciousness. Of this product he formed myriads of souls, employing the choicest part of the mixture for the end which he had in view, proceeding with order and measure, according to his knowledge and his reason. The souls were not necessarily different, but the choicest part, animated by the divine motion, was not identical with the rest. The first layer was superior to the second, more perfect, and pure, the second, inferior truly to the first, was superior to the third, and thus, until sixty degrees, was completed the total number. Only, the Divine established this law, that all equally should be eternal, being of one essence, whose forms he alone determines. He traced the limits of their sojourn on the heights of nature, so that they might turn the wheel according to the laws of order and of wise discretion, 
for the joy of their father. Then, having summoned to these splendid regions of ether the souls of every grade, he said to them, O souls, beautiful children of my breath and of my care, you whom I have produced with my hands, in order to consecrate you to my universe, hear my words as a law, quit not the place assigned to you by my will. The abode which awaits you is heaven, with its galaxy of stars and its thrones of virtue. If you attempt any transgression against my decree, I swear by my sacred breath, by that elixir of which I formed you, and by my creative hands, that I will speedily forge for you chains and cast you into punishment. Having thus spoken, the Divine, my Master, mingled together the rest of the congenial elements, earth and water, and pronouncing certain powerful and mystic words albeit different from the first he breathed into the liquid protoplasm motion and life, rendered it thicker and more plastic, and formed of it living beings of human shape. That which remained he gave to the loftiest souls inhabiting the region of the gods in the neighborhood of the stars, who are called the sacred genii. Work said he, my children, offspring of my nature, take the residue of my task, and let each one of you make beings in his image. I will give you models. Therewith he took the zodiac and ordained the world in conformity with vital movements, placing the animal signs after those of human form. And after having given forth the creative forces and generative breath for the whole range of beings yet to come, he withdrew, promising to unite to every visible work an invisible breath and a reproductive principle, so that each being might engender its similar without necessity to create continually new entities. And what did the souls do, O oh my mother? This ends part 1 on to part 2.